So we have started recording. Uh, we will start the YouTube telecast now. Thank you, Shruti. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Institute of China Studies in Delhi and the Conrad Administrative Firm, let me welcome you all to our Wednesday seminar. We have with us this evening a panel of very distinguished speakers who will be discussing the topic Future of Cross Straits Relations, Implications for the Region and India. Since the abstract and bios have been circulated well in advance, I will not be going into the details. I would be briefly introducing our panelists who have joined us here. We have Ms. Bonnie Gleaser, Director of the Asia Program at the German Marshall Fund. Dr. Alan Howell Young, Executive Director of the Taiwan Asia Exchange Foundation. He also serves as Deputy Director of the Institute of International Relations and Executive Director of the Center for Southeast Asian Studies at National Chang University. And Dr. Sana Hashmi, Visiting Fellow at the Taiwan Asia Exchange Foundation. She is also a non resident fellow at the Taiwan Next Gen Foundation and an affiliated scholar with the Research Institute for Indo Pacific Affairs, Japan. We are also joined by Mr. Peter Rimelli, resident representative to India, Conrad Adnan Stifton, who will be making the introductory remarks. And finally, chairing the discussion is Ambassador Ashok Gatha, Director of the Institute of Chinese Studies, New Delhi. Before I invite the chair to begin the proceedings, let me lay out the ground rules. All participants except the speakers will be muted for the duration of the evening. Participants are requested to send in their questions via the chat box or use the raise hand option. Please unmute yourself and leave and call upon to do so by the chair. I will now invite the chair to begin the proceedings. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Rijat. Thank you for that introduction. Let me welcome all of you to this edition of the ICS Wednesday seminar on the theme Future of Cross State Relations Implications for the Region and India. The Institute of Chinese Studies hosting this panel discussion in collaboration with the India Office of Conrad Adenauer Step 2. Print are a media partner for the event, which is being live streamed on YouTube, as Shruti mentioned earlier. The cross strait relations are today in a state of flux and severe stress. We have witnessed a marked shift in Taiwan away from China in recent years. Earlier, economic integration with the mainland gave rise to the hope in Beijing that Taiwan will gradually be absorbed in the PRC. However, what has happened in fact is that an overwhelming majority of the people in Taiwan have come to see themselves as Taiwanese rather than Chinese. And with the passage of time, the sense of Taiwanese identity is getting stronger, getting more pronounced. This has been accompanied by China adopting increasingly hardline posture vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan. The DPP coming to power in January 2016 presidential elections was the turning point. Tsai Ing-wen getting re-elected as president in January 2020 aggravated cross-strait tensions. China has put pressure on Taiwan on several fronts and reduced the international space available to it. China has also stepped up military pressure on Taiwan through enhanced naval and aerial activities in Taiwan Strait particularly since last year. Developments in Hong Kong have further added to cross-state strains. As the one country, two systems arrangement has virtually collapsed in Hong Kong. The prospect of that model offering a solution to the Taiwan question has further receded. Taiwanese companies have made some efforts to reduce their huge dependence on China, but remains by far the largest destination for exports and overseas direct investment. In the first quarter of 2021, there was a 68% decrease in investment by Taiwanese companies in China. There is expectation in India of a shift of Taiwanese investments in our direction as part of the new South Bond policy. The USA and its allies have enhanced their engagement with Taiwan, eliciting sharp complaints from China. Taiwan has become an even bigger factor in US-China strategic rivalry and regional dynamics. More recently, after the US withdrawal from Afghanistan, Chinese media has questioned the credibility of its commitment to Taiwan. However, it remains that Taiwan is the most sensitive flashpoint in US-China relations today. In parallel, there is greater urgency in the Chinese rhetoric on the unification of Taiwan, though no timeline has been given for the achievement of this objective. In a July 1st speech to mark the centenary of the Communist Party of China, Xi Jinping reiterated 
that resolving the Taiwan question and realizing China's complete reunification is a historic mission, an unshakable commitment of the party. China has not ruled out adopting non-peaceful means to unify Taiwan, and there has been much debate or of late if China will use force to annex Taiwan in the foreseeable future. In a congressional testimony in March this year, then commander of the Indo-Pacific Command, Admiral Philip Davidson, warned of the threat of military attack by China against Taiwan in the next six years. However, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Mark Milley, told the Senate Foreign Relations Committee on 17th June that China does not have the military capability or the intent to seize Taiwan by force in the immediate future. This is one question which will no doubt be discussed during deliberations today. There is no doubt that the salience of Taiwan in the regional security dynamics has gone up significantly in its annual white paper on defense presented last month. Japan gave the assessment that rising tensions surrounding Taiwan required its attention with a sense of crisis. The squad discussions too has covered Taiwan. Taiwan is an important issue in the emerging discourse on the Indo-Pacific. We have three fine experts to help us understand these developments linked to China-Taiwan relations, the future of cross-state ties, and the implications for the region and for India. However, before we hear from Dr. Bonnie Glazier, Dr. Ellen Young, and Dr. Hanasana Hasmi, let me invite my good friend and country head of India, Office of Conrad Adenauer Stiftung, Mr. Peter Remele, to make his introductory remarks. Over to you, Peter. Okay, thank you, Ambassador Kanta. Excellencies, esteemed speakers, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I would like to share with you my firm belief that the impact and consequences of future cross-strait relations will not only affect the region and neighboring countries, as today's event title seemingly suggests. Rather, they will have far larger ramifications that will carry ripple effects throughout the entire world. Now, the worst case scenario for any of our liberal states is China trying to seize Taiwan by means of force, which has recently become more and more plausible, as Ambassador Kanter just brought up. And it has become more plausible as Xi Jinping's strident and blunt warnings to the world during his speech on the centenary of the CCP's founding have made abundantly clear. The times when China respected the international rules-based order are now well and truly passé, as the CCP's incursions in the South China Sea, as well as East China Seas, India and Bhutan, along with a myriad other instances, have evidenced. As in this webinar, the future of Taiwan-China relations will be certainly analyzed in great detail. Allow me to contribute a slightly alternate angle on the topic by addressing the responsibility that we have as a democratic nations to defend Taiwan's democracy and the possibility, the possible consequences if we were to fail to do so. China has significantly increased military pressure on Taiwan, and I include the Coast Guard of China into that military pressure during the coronavirus pandemic, as evidenced by a number of aggressive military maneuvers towards Taiwan. It appears as if the CCP is slowly moving towards a point of no return by invading Taiwan, and apart from verbal condemnation so far, our countries have done very little to stop these repeated provocations aimed at the island nation. I'm using the term nation purposely. In view of the grave danger in which Taiwanese democracy wallows, recognition of Taiwan as a sovereign and independent nation by several Western, as also Asian democratic nations seems to be reaching an imperative level to deter China from such an invasion. But this might achieve the opposite result and is so fraught with risk. Taiwan is recognized still by just 14 out of 193 UN countries as a result of China's constant economic and military threats to all nations recognizing Taiwan's independence. But long gone, are the times when we tiptoed around Chinese sensitivities 
due to a fear of a Chinese economic backlash, in a situation where our intrinsic democratic values are under attack. Undoubtedly, recognizing Taiwan's independence will be perceived as aggression, aggression by the CCP and could lead to a further escalation of cross-strait tensions. But simply sitting on the sidelines and waiting for CCP leaders to return to a more humane and rules-based way of thought appears to be outright utopian. A shining example of my argument for the need to recognize the island state as an independent nation was given by the COVID-19 pandemic. With a million Taiwanese citizens working in China, the Taiwanese government possesses useful channels of communication with the population and realities at home in China. So when the first reports emerged from doctors in the Hubei province about a possible new viral respiratory disease, Taiwan was one of the first countries to hear about it. As it has since emerged, it also tried to pass on its findings and warnings, as well as the fact that the Chinese authorities were deliberately withholding relevant information from withholding the doctor's reports to the World Health Organization as early as December 2019. However, with Taiwan being excluded from the World Health Organization and not recognized as an independent country in any part of the UN system, their attempts to sound the alarm went unheard and unheeded. It may have been inevitable that Chinese citizens in Hubei province would suffer the consequences of their local officials' decision to cover up the appearance of the virus in the early days, but it was not inevitable that the rest of us would also suffer from such consequences. Moreover, if the US, our European nations, and our like-minded democratic Asian partners, such as Japan, and India are to formulate an appropriate response to China's attacks on Taiwan's territorial integrity, we must come to, I know it's difficult, but we must come to a common understanding of Beijing's belligerent behavior in the region and cooperate in finding successful remedies that our liberal democratic systems indeed already possess today. Failure to recognize Beijing's strategy and develop appropriate allied responses and counter strategies is likely to shift the economic, political, and security status quo in Asia and in the long run of the world, with China most likely to flout rules and norms of regional security uh, to flout rules re repeatedly and seek to create new rules in the regional and global economic space. To be completely candid, Taiwan's occupation would mean the end of freedom of speech, liberty and human rights for Taiwan's 23 million residents, as for millions others in Tibet, Mongolia, and now Hong Kong, and so on. I'm sure that you, ladies and gentlemen, as champions of human rights, democratic values, and freedom around the world, agree with me that we cannot simply leave the Taiwanese alone with this dismal prospect. I'd like to end my remarks with a quote from former Taiwanese President Chen Shui Bian, who said, the road to democracy may be winding, and it's like a river taking many curves, but eventually the river will reach the ocean. These words illustrate and maybe also encourage, like few others, how many hurdles the Taiwanese nation had to overcome in order to establish its current democratic system, but also to keep it up. And they illustrate the perspective I hold personally, and also as the re resident representative of the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung in India, for in spite of all the challenges our democratic systems have faced and are facing, not only in Taiwan, but also in my country, Germany and India, this lesson of history is ultimately crystal clear. Democracy will always win in the end if and as long we unite as like-minded nations to defend its principles against those who seek to harm, abuse, or even destroy it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. Thank you for your introductory remarks, for bringing out in a frank, lucid, and forthright manner 
your views on a whole set of issues relating to cross-state relations, including wide ramifications of those ties. Thanks for those remarks. Uh, I will now call upon Dr. Bonnie Glazier, Dr. Ellen Young, and Dr. Sana Hasmi to speak for about 10, 12 minutes each. Thereafter, as uh, Rija explained, uh, we'll have open discussions. Please raise your questions in the chat box. You may also indicate your desire to ask a question in the chat box, and, and, I, and I'll invite you to do so. You may unmute yourself and ask your question or offer your comments as concisely as possible. Please keep yourself muted unless called upon to speak. Let me now invite uh, Bonnie, Director of Asia Program of the Jamal Marshall Fund of the United States, to make her opening remarks. Over to you, Bonnie. Thank you so much for having me, um, Ambassador Kanta. It is a, it, it is a privilege uh, to join this panel with uh, both of our hosts and the other distinguished panelists. Um, and I very much enjoyed uh, your in, in, insightful uh, and, uh, and inspiring remarks, uh, both by you and, uh, and, and, and Peter. Um, I will uh, uh, start by adding a few points of analysis to the current cross strait uh, relationship. Uh, uh, of course, as you noted, uh, the cross strait relationship has deteriorated since 2016, but it's important to note that the roots and the sources of friction um, in that relationship do go back to the Mayunjo administration, particularly 2014, when popular discontent arose uh, regarding the then uh, KMT government's handling of the uh, negotiation of the services trade agreement with China. And that um, is important because of uh, the potential uh, KMT coming back to power, which I will talk about in a minute, and some of the, the differences in, uh, in, the, in the candidates. In fact, there's going to be an election for the uh, KMT chair uh, next month. But first, I, I want to say, uh, importantly, from my perspective, it, in terms of Beijing's own approach uh, to Taiwan, the main policy guideline that Xi Jinping inherited from Hu Jintao remains in place. That is peaceful development of cross-strait relations. And this is a guideline that Xi Jinping himself has reaffirmed. Uh, of course, the objective ends remain the same. It is um, the historical inevitability of what they call reunification. But the ways and the means have changed to some extent. Um, uh, obviously, when the KMT was in power, um, uh, the balance of carrots and sticks in Beijing's policy uh, really leaned toward the positive inducements. But since 2016, we've seen growing coercion and uh, pressure. Military coercion has become a prominent component. It's not the only component. Of course, there's been diplomatic uh, coercion as well, and recently some economic coercion where uh, China has blocked the importation of, uh, of pineapples from Taiwan. But the military coercion is particularly worrisome. Um, we saw the PLA Air Force cross the center line for the first time in 20 years in March 2019. Um, and since then, there has been uh, frequent activity in Taiwan's um, uh, air defense identification zone and uh, naval exercises conducted close to Taiwan. We've seen an increasing number of cyber attacks, disinformation operations, um, and Beijing has often tried to punish Taiwan um, for strengthening ties with Washington um, and uh, purchasing uh, weapons from the United States. Uh, cross strait relations could deteriorate further in the future or they could improve. It does depend on several variables. This includes uh, China's policies, it includes Taiwan's policies, and to some extent also includes Washington's policies. But I will also get back to what I think is a very important point that Peter made, is that the, uh, the policies of other countries and uh, like-minded countries and democracies matters um, uh, very much. Um, but first I will say that I think it is highly unlikely that Beijing is going to soften its position toward Taiwan. Um, uh, it, I think China will continue to demand that any leader of Taiwan recognize that Taiwan is part of China. Uh, no DPP president is likely to accept that position. And I believe it's uncertain um, whether a future KMT president will accept that position. If the K KMT indeed wants to return to power, it's going to have to take into account the views 
of the Taiwanese people. And in the aftermath of the implementation of the national security law in Hong Kong, there's ever greater skepticism in Taiwan toward uh, China. And the trend of gr this growing sense of Taiwanese identity continues to grow. And polls, of course, show that the majority continues to port, support the maintenance of the status quo. But importantly, support for eventual independence has been increasing um, in recent years. So in terms of the implications, I would predict that cross-strait relations will remain fraught, even if the KMT comes back to power, whether that would be 2024 or 2028. Um, there is a possibility, yes, that uh, official contacts across the strait could resume, that tensions could ease, but this is not a certainty. Um, I believe that there will continue to be tensions and Beijing's demands, even from the KMT government, may grow. Secondly, I think that the PRC is unlikely to use force to unify Taiwan with mainland China, um, at least in the next five years and probably even beyond. Um, unless, and there are some conditions, unless Taiwan declares de jure independence or the United States takes actions that cross Beijing red Beijing's red lines. This includes things like deploying forces um, uh, on Taiwan or encouraging Taiwan to develop nuclear weapons. These are China's real red lines. Um, there are other things that do not cross uh, Beijing's red lines. Um, and we've seen many of them, um, in, including uh, many of the steps that were taken during the, uh, the Trump administration. But I would say that I disagree with assessments made by former and current U.S. military officers about the pending um, strike by China on Taiwan. I think their forecasts are based primarily on military capabilities, um, and I believe that other factors are important as well. I will tick off a few. There is the risk of failure, which would be in inextricably linked to uh, the legitimacy of the Chinese Communist Party. There is the potential for a wider military conflict with the United States. And you, I believe that the PLA has long taken into account the likelihood, not just the possibility, but the likelihood that the U.S. military would intervene if China were to use military force against Taiwan. And we can talk about the implications of Afghanistan, but my short answer to that is that Taiwan is not Afghanistan. Um, the history of the U.S.-Taiwan relationship is different. The purpose of the relationship is different. The, the economic relationship is different. And most importantly, Taiwan is a vibrant democracy. Um, using force against Taiwan, I think, would derail the potential for China to achieve its 2035 and 2049 goals that Xi Jinping articulated at the 19th Party Congress. In fact, it could undermine rather than enable national rejuvenation. And realizing, um, and, and, and the use of force also could realize an anti-China coalition, um, as other countries around the, uh, the world uh, fear that Beijing will use force against uh, them or in their region. So I fully expect China will step up actions to punish, coerce, and isolate Taiwan. This is what we call, of course, gray zone tactics. And China has a very big toolkit. It has only begun to deploy, and I think this is the threat that we should be working on. So preservation of peace and stability, as well as Taiwan's autonomy, is in the interests of the United States, India, and other like-minded countries. The more the countries signal an interest in the preservation of peace and stability across the strait, the more this will strengthen deterrence. Uh, Japan, South Korea, the EU, um, the G7 have all expressed in joint statements or communiques that the Taiwan Strait should remain peaceful. Um, I think democracy should make greater efforts, both unilaterally and collectively, uh, to support Taiwan. India has important interests, in, uh, I believe, in the Taiwan Strait. Preserving Taiwan's uh, democracy, protecting the crucial role that Taiwanese companies uh, play in IT supply chains, such as semiconductors, bolstering Taiwan's role as a provider of public goods and a supporter of the rules-based international order, and avoiding a, a PRC takeover by force, which could um, embolden China to be more aggressive and settle other territorial disputes by force, including the border um, with India. So finally, I'll close just by saying a few uh, steps of recommendation of things that, Ty that India could take um, alongside other uh, democracies. Uh, Taiwan will likely arise in the context of the Quad this fall when the Quad leaders meet. 
um, hopefully um, uh, most of them in, uh, in person. Just two weeks ago, senior officials from the Quad countries discussed the importance of maintaining peace and stability in the uh, Taiwan Strait. And this is a signal, I think, of willingness of those countries to make such a statement at the leader's uh, level. Um, hopefully, this is something that um, India will support. Secondly, India could expand cooperation with Taiwan in, in areas that are mutually beneficial. This includes uh, cyber, health, uh, supply chains. There really is a, a long list of areas where bilateral relations could be strengthened. Thirdly, India could participate in um, the Global Cooperation Training Framework, which was started between the U.S. and Taiwan, essentially holding workshops to showcase uh, Taiwan's expertise and enable Taiwan to have more networking and interaction with uh, other countries. It started in, the, in, the, in Asia and it, it, between the United States and Taiwan. It is now expanded to be basically a global program. Um, it is now co-hosted by, by Japan. It's been internationalized. And other countries such as uh, Australia, um, uh, Canada, and I believe the EU recently uh, co-sponsored a, uh, a workshop under this, what we call the GCTF. Um, and this is something that um, it's below the radar, not quite seen as provocative by, Jay, by Beijing, but nevertheless, a very important, I think, mechanism and way of supporting Taiwan and its international participation. And then quietly, I think India should be holding more quiet discussions between defense experts um, uh, in, the, in their own country with Taiwan and other uh, like-minded countries about PLA capabilities, its tactics, its strategy, uh, and uh, ways that we can work together in order to uh, strengthen uh, deterrence in, uh, in the Taiwan Strait. So thank you again uh, for having me, and I look forward to the subsequent discussion. Thank you, Bonnie, for those uh, most perceptive and highly nuanced remarks about uh, cross-state relations about the you know, wider ramifications of what's happening in, in, in relations between Taiwan and China. And most importantly, for the set of recommendations that you have given about what India can do vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan. I think those are very sensible, very practical and pragmatic suggestions. And, and I'm sure they deserve very close attention. In fact, there is a growing uh, body of opinion in India that uh, India can be more proactive in terms of its uh, Taiwan policy. We sometimes tend to be over cautious in this regard. Uh, thanks, Bonnie, for those remarks. Uh, I'll now turn to Dr. Ellen Hao Yang, Executive Director of Taiwan Asia Exchange Foundation, and invite him to make his remarks. Over to you, Dr. Yang. Thank you, Director. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> um, it is my great honor and pleasure to attend this. Uh, uh, webinar, and I'm very happy to share uh, my observation as uh, the Taiwanese perspective to the main theme of our discussion. I think uh, listening to the insightful remark <clears throat> remarks, and it is clearly that China has been the the key words of our attention. However, if you look at the recent the strategic currents, you can find out Taiwan attention to Taiwan has been paid among the regional stakeholders. For example, in some high level uh, joint commit joint statement and also communicate, you can find the peace and stability of the Taiwan Strait has been uh, highlighted and has been. Uh, attracting attention from different stakeholders and decision makers. And I would like to uh, briefly share my uh, observation of my remark, starting from the current situation of how Taiwan, uh, the, the current administration and also Taiwanese people react to the current situation of the cross strait. <clears throat> by first pinpointing three knots, N-O-T-S. The first one is, during the past five years, the current administration uh, led by President Tsai Ing-wen 
is trying not to try very hard not to pro provoke China and to not to deteriorate the current situation between Taiwan and China, especially uh, highlighted in some discussion called the current situation as the cold peace. And if you look at uh, the military uh, intervention and also the the PLA's uh, intrusion to Taiwanese uh, air and also the territorial waters, you can find that today is the almost the end of August, which means in 2021st, we have 240 days. And out of these 240 days, it's around 150 to 160 days. We can, we, we can see that the intervention from the PLA and they send the uh, jet jet uh, uh, jet fighter fighter jets and also the navy vessels to circulate Taiwan, especially to our southwest point, and it imposes serious serious military threat to our airspace and also to to uh, pressure Taiwan through the military coercion. And that has been crossing uh, the middle line, the central line of the Taiwan Strait and impose the serious military <coughs> intervention and also military threat to Taiwan. And those uh, coercion has been uh, perceived as uh, very uh, seriously among our Taiwanese people. And the current government tried our best, try its best not to provoke uh, China and not to deteriorate, deteriorate the current situation. And the second not is not over rely on one single market. That is in terms of the big, uh, in terms of the economic connection. So not to over rely on China. Therefore, since 2016, uh, current administration try to promote Taiwan's presence in this region through the practice of the new Southman policy, as mentioned earlier by the director. And the idea is to engage the neighboring country in Southeast Asia and in South Asia, including our partner, France is uh, India, by promoting Taiwan's multifaceted engagement through the econ economic connection, through the talent training and educational collaboration, and through public health and medical collaboration, and agricultural, uh, coll regional agricultural collaboration to protect the uh, food security and also the food, uh, uh, the food supply. And finally, the overall idea is to achieve the people-centered development agenda and to engage uh, our friends and also our partners through more institutional time. And during the past five years, this policy has been recognized as Taiwan's regional approach to Asia and also to accommodate Taiwan into the Indo-Pacific dynamics. And we, as, as Taiwanese business, uh, uh, network keep uh, promoting Taiwan's uh, contribution to local and national economy in Southeast Asia and also to redirect the orientation of the supply chain, including the ICT industry. During the past years, uh, with the promotion and implementation of the new Southbound policy, we try to secure a more possible and brighter uh, future among Taiwan and also our neighbor counterparts in the region. And it is also true that uh, the perception of Taiwanese business and also Taiwan's national image has been uh, has been increasingly uh, increased among during the past years. Uh, 
On behalf of Taiwan Asia Exchange Foundation, every year we conduct the social survey in individual Southeast Asia country to evaluate Taiwanese uh, the local perception to Taiwanese business and also to Taiwanese uh, national image at different locality. And we find every year the situation is getting better and better. So with the positive implementation of the new Southbound policy on the ground, we are delighted to develop different uh, partnership through institutional tie to our neighboring country. And that will uh, contribute to the rule-based international order in the Indo-Pacific. And the third note that I'm going to touch upon is, uh, I think Taiwan as a whole will not give in the military pressure imposed by Beijing. And uh, we, we have been working very hard to be get well prepared. So since the late 2019, uh, when the spread out of the COVID-19, uh, I think the world has suffered a lot. And in this year, in around uh, May, actually the second wave of the local virus infection cases break out in Taiwan and it spread very fast. Hundreds of hundreds of infection cases uh, last for a few uh, weeks. Although Taiwan has performed quite well fighting against the COVID-19 pandemic during the past two years. However, this year we encountered some difficulty, but I'm delighted to share with our friend in DC and also in India that today, the local case of Taiwan's local infection, domestic infection decreased to zero. So during the past months, I think the government tried very best to activate the public private partnership, working with the civil society and also working with our people to prevent the spread of this uh, pandemic. And also we try our best to develop the local produced vaccine. And I do believe that in the forthcoming future, we will be ready to continue our contribution and to help our neighbors. During our uh, dialogue with neighboring counterpart in Vietnam and in, in Indonesia and also in Malaysia, we learn from their situation that they are in great demand of the vaccine. And at the same moment, they have received a lot of uh, doses uh, of the vaccine from China, and they would like to diversify uh, this uh, vaccine diplomacy and also to receive more, uh, more useful and also more effective vaccine from other countries. And I think Taiwan is one of the alternative. So these are the three nuts, nuts that I would like to share with our friends so far. Uh, after five years, the second term of President Tsai Ing-wen's administration has kept going. And not to provoke China, not to over rely on one single market, market and not to give in under the military threat is the three nuts that Taiwan has been working very hard. And we have been very actively to pay attention to the regional counterparts policy and approach to engaging Asia. For example, in the case of India, we pay attention to the strategic rationale of SACA, security and growth for all in the region. And I totally agree with uh, Director Glasser that from the framework of GCTF that Taiwan have been working closely with United States and to extend the institutional collaboration with Japan, Australia, and maybe in the future, we can work closely with India to fulfill the implementation of the SAGA of, of in India and also of the people-centered approach of the new South Bank policy. And apart from the attention to the neighboring counterpart, 
I think Taiwanese government, think tank, and civil society organization has also very keen to participate in the process of craft dialogue through track 1.5 or track 2 process so that we can make Taiwanese voice heard among our friends and also can try to uh, reach out through more effective ways. I think I will stop here. Once again, thank you for the kind invitation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yang, for those uh, <coughs> perceptive and thoughtful remarks uh, for dwelling on the policy of three knots of tying one administration for bringing out in a in a in a very perceptive manner, uh, you know, the policy of New South Bond, uh, New New South Bond policy and its imp implications, its scope. Thanks for those remarks. I have some follow up questions which I'll come to later. Now let me turn to Dr. Sana Hashmi, visiting fellow at the Taiwan Asia Exchange Foundation. Sana, will you make your opening remarks? Um, thank you, Ambassador Kanta, and uh, thank you for hosting this event and having me here to discuss a very important issue. Uh, I remember exactly a year ago, I gave a talk on India-Taiwan relations in the ICS uh, webinar. Uh, so much has changed at the global level since then. US has a new administration, or if I may call this administration uh, more action oriented on Taiwan uh, and further institutionalization of the quadrilateral security dialogue is happening with the possible first in person quad uh, leader summit soon. And then India's China policy has also been changing drastically. Uh, then there's also significant change in Japan's policy towards Taiwan and Boni already mentioned about the mention of uh, the importance of peace and stability uh, in the Taiwan Strait, in the US, Japan statement, US, South Korea, and even the G7 uh, communique on the Taiwan Strait. Uh, but when we talk about India, I think in the past year, uh, Taiwan has gained in enormous popularity. This is the very first time that the Indian think tanks are devoting so much of time and resources on studying and discussing Taiwan. So I think that was not the case before, and this awareness and discussion are creating opportunities for India-Taiwan relations to grow. Um, and in my opinion, this is important as India-Taiwan relations are nowhere compared to, uh, for example, Taiwan-US, Taiwan-ASEAN, or for that matter, Japan and Australia as well. So I think it's important to highlight that there are different uh, determinants, drivers and motivation when we talk about India-Taiwan relations. Uh, so as underappreciated and understated, uh, has this relation has been uh, this particular set of relations will take its own course. So traditionally being non-aligned India's Taiwan policy was guided by India China relations, specifically the one China policy. In fact, due to the suspension of relations with China till 1976 and other pressing issues to deal with uh, the cross strait tensions and relations weren't really a factor for uh, in India's regional policy. So uh, since the beginning, uh, India opted to adhere to the one China policy and was the second non-communist country to recognize the PRC. So it's important to note here that India never mentioned Taiwan while referring to one China policy. And uh, it's a known fact that India has even stopped mentioning one China policy anywhere since 2010. And in fact, in 2014, then external affair minister of India, Sushma Saraj, also asked uh, uh, her counterpart Wangi to respect one India policy if Wangi wants India to reciprocate on the one China policy. Uh, so with Tibet and Xinjiang, what we have seen that India has accepted China's interpretation of the one China policy. In fact, till 2005, India used to mention that Tibet autonomous region is a part of China. And But from 2008, uh, India even removed the mention of Tibet from uh, the mention of one China policy in 2008 statement. Uh, but when we talk about Taiwan, I feel that India's interpretation of one China policy regarding Taiwan is different from that of China. And to put it into perspective, India has kind of left it vague and open ended. And from India's perspective, its approach towards Taiwan is still restricted, uh, despite problems with China it still adheres to one China policy. Uh, but in the contemporary times, with changing geopolitical scenarios, India has much to offer regarding Taiwan and China then during the Cold War period and the post-Cold War period. So situation has changed dramatically now. The violent Galwan clashes have changed India's outlook on China and the region. Uh, it's no more about differing perception. This is a fact now. India has realized that the boundary dispute is no more about a differing perception. 
Then China's aggression has become a shared concern uh, for a lot of countries now. There's a growing realization that, that a collective response is needed to counter the China challenge. So this is the first time that China has opened multiple fronts at the same time. And several countries at the same time are witnessing and facing similar challenges with China. So now India is keenly watching this situation and uh, the support for Taiwan has also increased among the masses in India. And the peace in the Taiwan state is increasingly becoming important for countries in the Indo-Pacific region, including India. So uh, it is important to talk about the repercussions of and response from India as it is the only quad country that has not really spoken about Taiwan openly yet. Uh, but there's no doubt that the issue of Taiwan state is being discussed among the like-minded countries and China is indeed a driving uh, a factor in India, but China is indeed driving countries closer. Uh, and in fact, Boni also mentioned uh, during her remarks, and uh, I also talked about this uh, uh, in a webinar last week that uh, after the senior official meeting, uh, even though it was just America that mentioned Taiwan in their statement, I believe that it's not a question of if, but it's a question of when the other three quad countries will start mentioning Taiwan in the quad meeting statement. Uh, so there's a consensus among emerging uh, uh, like-minded countries uh, and Taiwan has started figuring in the Quad dialogues and with India, changes are happening slowly but steadily. Also, to minimize the cross-strait tensions and brinkmanship, it is important that Taiwan is included in the Indo-Pacific discourse. So, as the Indo-Pacific regional construct evolves, uh, the need for major stakeholders to have a viable Taiwan policy becomes more and more relevant and important now. And for India, there are several motivations for it to support uh, Taiwan and to voice its support, support for Taiwan. Uh, so uh, I would give a few reasons why it is important for India to support Taiwan in the Indo-Pacific region. So the first is India being an advocate of free, open and inclusive Indo-Pacific and a proponent of the creation of a rules-based order. Facilitating Taiwan's participation in the Indo-Pacific region would bolster its image of a responsible stakeholder. Taiwan, that is a robust democracy and shares similar values and have uh, somewhat shared concerns. Its participation will only contribute uh, towards the achieving further stability to the region and it would further aid India's resolve for ensuring a rules-based order. Then um, second, there has been a trend with China's propensity to escalate tensions with the countries. Uh, I'll give you an example when in 1962, at the peak of the Cold War, uh, and the two superpowers were occupied with the Cuban Missile Crisis, China waged a war on in India. So I think with Taiwan as well, China does not want countries to talk about Taiwan much or show support for Taiwan. Uh, but in my opinion, if more and more countries are engaging Taiwan and voicing support for Taiwan, then it will kind of deter China from militarily coercing Taiwan. Then third, a potential conflict in the Taiwan Strait would prove detrimental to the prevailing regional order stability. There's no doubt about that. And being at the center of the region, India would also have to face the repercussion of a potential conflict between China and Taiwan to ensure stability. I believe that India should facilitate Taiwan's participation so the likelihood of the conflict is evitable. Then uh, India has also assumed an important place in the region and it's indispensable to several countries' approaches and policies in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, India has aspirations to play a decisive role in the region, but I believe that India cannot really fully realize its ambitions uh, unless it makes some bold moves and decision that suits its interest and reinforce its image of a country uh, that is not bullied by China. So India's foreign policy calculation should be independent of what China desires India to do, and India should realize that China cannot really drive the course of India's foreign policy. Uh, but when I say, uh, when I talk about the change in India's Taiwan policy or that India's policy towards Taiwan needs to be uh, altered, I do not mean to say that India should entirely change its China policy, but to slowly also work towards elevating ties in the areas of mutual cooperation with Taiwan. So India is now focused on managing tensions with China, and in the process, Taiwan has long been ignored. It has been uh, the fear of risking ties with China and the lack of framework to engage Taiwan that have limited the scope of uh, India-Taiwan relations. So. Uh, I think in this situation, it is important for India to realize the limitation of this approach and that and there's a need to subsequently adjust its China policy to new realities. It also makes sense uh, uh, when uh, Chinese President Xi Jinping uh, hasn't really shown any regard for any country's territorial sensitivities till now. 
and uh, by making CPEC that passes through the disputed territory between India and Pakistan, a flagship project of the Belt and Road Initiative, and getting involved in recurring boundary standoff with India, China has made it evident that it has no interest in resolving the boundary dispute and also managing uh, tensions with China. So while continuing dialogue with China is a part of the solution, uh, you know, India has to keep engaging China in a dialogue. India is also adopting a former approach of keeping the dispute at the forefront of all the discussions. So I think, uh, and I also believe, and I'm seeing this change that India is no longer following the approach of uh, not letting the dispute impact the other aspects of the relations or putting the boundary dispute on the back burner or leaving the resolution to the next generation of leadership. So I think this is the thing that India has not been doing the past one year at least. And at the same time, there is a realization that sacrificing ties with Taiwan and the hope of gaining tangible benefit in the boundary dispute is not a good idea anymore. So we know that a number of positive developments have taken place in the past few years when it comes to India-Taiwan. And there's a range of collaborative uh, activities that have taken place that are away from public attention. And having interacted with Taiwanese diplomats, since I'm based out of Thai Taipei right now, and even scholars and having worked with the MEA, I'm aware that not everything is shared with the media. And I agree that it is also not necessary uh, as well at this point of time. But uh, what is also important that India is realizing uh, that managing ties with China does not necessarily mean overlooking the merit of engaging Taiwan. And uh, at the same time, engaging Taiwan does not necessarily mean that India has to change its adherence to the so-called one China policy. And to build India-Taiwan ties, we have to stop giving undue importance to the one China policy and considering it a major determinant in India-Taiwan relations. Uh, it's very important to work towards building stronger ties with Taiwan and India should aim to have a three-pronged approach towards Taiwan in this context. Uh, changes need to be made at bilateral, regional and multilateral level. At the bilateral level, engaging Taiwan is mutually beneficial. There is no doubt about that. We have seen Taiwan's COVID-19 response. The previous uh, speakers have already talked about that in greater detail. Uh, and I think this is the right time to devise a synchronized strategy to engage each other. Uh, Taiwan should also take step, India should also take step to engage each other. And at the political level, both countries should take a step further. Taiwan should be more proactive with India, while India should carefully nurture its engagement with Taiwan. There are hundreds of uh, areas where the two countries have not even initiated a dialogue. And all this can come before in, even India and Taiwan head towards security alignment. So uh, some of the areas include higher education, uh, especially in the information technology, biochemical fields, health sector degrees, such as nursing, as well as Mandarin language training. Then a long-term framework to further increase cooperation in the economic, cultural, educational, and P2P science and technology field should also be developed. A holistic approach for exchanges between the two governments, businesses, and citizens should also be adopted. Uh, then at the regional level, uh, I have been advocating for India to learn from Japan's approach towards Taiwan. I think it's very important that India should, should take cues from the approaches of countries such as not only Japan, but also Singapore on how to devise a consistent Taiwan policy. So India is collaborating with Taiwan and third country, uh, sorry, Japan with third countries. And the two countries might also find ways to work with Taiwan in the connectivity and infrastructural domains. Uh, then Boni also talked about GCTF. I also believe that GCTF is such an important platform and India should uh, be a part of GCTF. It's Taiwan-led and US and Japan are already a part of it. And this platform exists so that countries could learn from Taiwan's best practices. So we talk about the issue-based coalition when we talk about cooperation within the Indo-Pacific. So I think GCTF is such a good example when we talk about issue-based coalition between Taiwan and the countries of the Indo-Pacific region. And I believe that uh, India's office in Taiwan should uh, start engaging Taiwan and should also start cooperating with Taiwan and other countries within the framework, the broader framework of the GCTF. Uh, finally, India should also have a multilateral approach towards Taiwan. Now that the Indo-Pacific region is embraced by several countries, it's uh, crucial to consider Taiwan as an important part of the region and a multilateral and collective effort is needed to include Taiwan in the evolving regional order. Um, and we also have to look at it from Taiwan's perspective and interest in the Indo-Pacific as well. India is an important part of the Indo-Pacific and uh, Taiwan has on several occasions expressed willingness to play an important role in the region. 
uh, Alan already talked about the new South Bond policy and what is the importance of new South Bond policy for both uh, Taiwan and India. And new South Bond policy is actually complementary to a lot of countries' policies, such as the US free and open Indo Pacific, Japan's enhanced partnership for the quality infrastructure, and India's activities policy as well. So for Taiwan, uh, focusing on India and cooperation with India will also mean greater visibility and credibility in the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, but the problem here is the lack of reciprocity from India's side. Uh, we see a lot of positive development. There are a lot of positive development, but there's still more to achieve in the relation. The potential still remains underutilized. Uh, so going forward, I believe that greater institutionalization of the quadrilateral dialogue will facilitate Taiwan's inclusion in the Indo-Pacific discourse. And uh, India could perhaps, uh, as I said, learn from Japan-Taiwan relations and quadrilateral countries should also work harder towards Taiwan's greater participation in the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, so to conclude, I would say that uh, with India-Taiwan relations, at the official level, things are happening. But to give it more thrust, political level engagement has to be started sooner than later. I stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sana Hasmi, for those uh, very insightful remarks. Uh, Sana made a number of very important points. Uh, well, she brought out uh, uh, in a very cogent manner how India has pursued its one China policy in a very nuanced manner especially since 2010 and how this one China policy did not come in the way of India developing linkages with Taiwan. Asana also gave a number of uh, very uh, pragmatic, practical uh, uh, suggestions on how India can develop and expand its, its relations with Taiwan. Thank you for those for the remarks. We'll have, I'm sure we'll have several follow-up questions to that. Uh, now the floor is open for uh, for discussion, uh, I'll request participants to indicate their desire to ask questions in the chat box or write out the questions if they so wish. While I wait for them to come out, come up with questions, so let me set the ball rolling by posing some questions to the three speakers. Bonnie, so, if I can begin with you, uh, you know, you talked about you know various. Uh, uh, issues relating to this whole issue, whole, whole threat perception of uh, China adopting military means to, to annex Taiwan. And you came to the conclusion that uh, that scenario uh, is less likely today. There are a number of reasons why China will find it difficult to, to opt for you know, a military annexation of Taiwan, uh, though it will continue to pursue the policy of uh, enhanced uh, military, diplomatic, uh, and economic coercion vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan. But I wanted to ask you if, if PRC has any timeline for uh, the complete reunification of China. Uh, will it be 2049 when China marks the centenary of the foundation founding of PRC, uh, or it's willing to wait longer? Uh, what are your thoughts on that? This is one question I had. My second question is about, you know, how Taiwan will figure in the emerging discourse in Indo-Pacific, more specifically in the deliberations on Quad. Uh, as uh, Sana brought out, uh, USA publicly has uh, raised this issue in the context of Quad discussions. Uh, India has been more reticent in this regard. Do you expect Taiwan to acquire a greater salience in a Quad and Indo-Pacific dialogue? Bonnie? Uh, thank you, uh, Ambassador. Uh, great, great, great questions. Uh, I believe you said in your opening remarks that you did not believe that, uh, that China has a timeline for uh, reunification. And I agree with that. Um, now, we should, of course, acknowledge that in uh, Xi Jinping's speech in January 2nd, uh, 2019, that he gave, which is the only comprehensive speech he's given since he has come to power on policy uh, toward Taiwan, uh, 
um, and it was the 40th anniversary of the speech to Taiwan compatriots. So in other words, this was basically, it was mandatory for him to make a speech. Chinese leaders have always made a speech on the uh, on the, each of the uh, major anniversaries. Um, so Hu Jintao did so as well on the uh, 40th uh, anniversary. And he did loosely link um, the uh, the idea of unification with national rejuvenation of the country in 2049. But my own view, um, uh, which I have come to from my own analysis of uh, other things Xi Jinping has said, but also conversations with many experts and officials uh, from China on this issue, that this is not seen by Beijing as a hard um, deadline. Um, uh, it is a goal and it remains an, an objective that Xi Jinping wants to uh, achieve. But let's, of course, be honest, he's not going to be in power in 2049. What's important is what he will say over the next maybe five to 10 years. Xi Jinping will assume a third term, probably next fall at the 20th Party Congress. That will be, of course, a five-year term. He might serve another five-year term after that. And whether or not he makes this a hard deadline at some point um, over that period where he remains in power, I think is something to watch. Uh, but I think today it is not um, a, a deadline. And your question on the quad. Um, um, I think uh, it is noteworthy, as I said in my remarks, that the senior officials from the Quad just two weeks ago um, did say, discuss Taiwan and agree to reveal publicly that they talked about uh, Taiwan. And I think this is a signal that it perhaps um, uh, India is it, it sees that it can get a bit of cover from some of the other countries that have noted in joint statements uh, uh, with the United States and, and, and others that preservation of peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait is, uh, is important. And so um, I believe that there is a good likelihood now that that will be uh, uh, um, included in the, in the statement in, in the fall. But um, I agree with you, India has been uh, reticent. And of course, among the four countries, it is the most reticent. Um, the U.S. Um, uh, probably the most forward-leaning, uh, but Japan increasingly so. And it is noteworthy that um, uh, Tara Lhasa, when he talked about Taiwan, said that it is essentially existential for Japan, that this relates to Japan's survival, which that term survival is very important because it goes to the issue of Japan's constitution and the circumstances in which it could use um, collective defense. Um, uh, and uh, so uh, Japan is increasingly, I think, um, uh, willing to talk publicly about its concerns about Chinese uh, threats uh, against, uh, against Taiwan. And I think Australia increasingly too, although not quite as forward leaning as the US and Japan. So this is a process. Uh, but I believe that um, uh, that the, the Quad will uh, will definitely discuss Taiwan. And then the question is what other actions uh, could be taken uh, by the four countries. And certainly in the economic realm um, and uh, trade realm and uh, areas of supply chains, uh, things related to connectivity, um, which uh, Sana talked about, um, infrastructure working together uh, with Taiwan. The U.S. and Japan has already worked quietly with Taiwan uh, to support a project in Palau, uh, one of the 15 countries that Taiwan continues to have diplomatic ties with. So perhaps this is another area of uh, potential collaboration. But I think it will be slow um, and it may depend to some extent on the development of India's own relationship with China. My um, observation um, a, 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 as somebody from uh, for, who looks at, at the India, China and India, Taiwan relationship, it seems to me that when relations are more uh, tense and fraught between India and China, that uh, New Delhi is willing to do more um, with Taiwan. Um, so I think that that factor will matter too. Thank you. Thank you, Bonnie. Those were very perceptive remarks. Uh, let me now turn to Dr. Alan Yang. Uh, Dr. Yang, you know, you talked about, you know, Taiwan's uh, new southbound policy, which is being 
pursued under the Sang one administration. Uh, my question uh, is, how do you see this uh, policy being implemented vis-a-vis -vis India? Uh, there, there is some concern in, in India that uh, while uh, it's a, it's a you know, uh, flagship uh, policy of Tsai administration, uh, uh, as far as implementation is concerned, uh, uh, there's something missing. Uh, at least in India, Taiwan relations. How do you see New South Pond policy being, you know, spelt out and uh, unfold vis-a-vis uh, -vis India? This was one my one question. My second question is, you know, in in the in the wake of uh, you um, USA's somewhat disorderly withdrawal from uh, Afghanistan, uh, the Chinese official media has been at pains to project that uh, you know there are uh, doubts about the us credibility including its commitment to taiwan how this issue is playing out in taiwan are there concerns uh, in taiwan about the us commitment to to taiwan or uh, it's it's appreciated that the taiwan is different it's a it's as bonnie brought out uh, in in her remarks uh, taiwan is no afghanistan you know there are number of uh, factors uh, which will uh, ensure that uh, US commitment to Taiwan will be of a different order. So I had these two questions for you. Doctor. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador, for this wonderful two questions. I think I can share my uh, reflection to you. Regarding the first one, Taiwan's new Southbound policy vis-a-vis -vis India, India's policy. I think, as I mentioned, the saga is the is the core uh, strategic rationale of the Indian uh, foreign policy, especially in the Indo-Pacific. And as India tried to implement the transformation from look east policy to act east policy, we find it's very important to connecting India. And also, not only paying attention to the act east policy, we also pay attention to Prime Minister Modi's Indo-Pacific Ocean Initiative in terms of the maritime engagement. So I think when India look and act east, Taiwan uh, look west, and also New South Bank go south, and uh, there should be uh, some, uh, actually there has been some existing domain of the collaboration. For example, regarding the Indo-Pacific Ocean Initiative, there are seven pillars, including blue economy and also the marine time in environmental protection. And two, especially in terms of the capacity building program, under the framework of Indo-Pacific uh, Ocean Initiative. And Taiwan's new Southbound policy also pay attention to the people-to-people -people connect. And we work on the capacity building program as well. So this is something that I think both countries are democracy. We are a democratic country and also our uh, policy as Taiwan recalibrate our policy from the China focus policy during the past administration to a more Asian-wide and Asian-centered uh, policy. I think uh, it is quite encouraging that with the recalibration, re recalibrating orientation of Taiwan's new South Park policy, we will be delighted to embrace our partner in Southeast Asia and also in South Asia. And during the past five years, there have been some encour encouraging progress of the implementation of the new Southbound policy. And I think, especially in the public health and medical collaboration program, we also work with India's uh, hospital to work on the one country, one center program by providing a training program for doctoral, uh, for a doctoral uh, staff and also the medical doctor and medical nurses 
and also we exchange ideas and also the the expertise on the public health and the pandemic issues. And when India was in need in this May, as the second wave of the domestic uh, infection rises, we our contact in India share with us the updates and we send the info, info, information to the decision maker and President Tsai uh, quickly made the decision to donate and to contribute to Indian government and also to Indian people in need. And I think that present the very notion of the people-centered uh, uh, New South Wales policy. And also we do believe that democracy should work with each other and should help with each other. And the India-Taiwan connection will be a very important case for the like-minded country in Asia, in the Indo-Pacific. And the second issue is the Afghanistan issue. I do believe that uh, in a democratic society, there will be different discourses and also different uh, political faction and based upon the ideological uh, cleavage. And it is true that during the past uh, uh, few days, there are some discourses among Taiwanese society, especially from the opposition party. They strongly doubt the U.S. commitment to Taiwan. And I also agree that <clears throat> Uh, as uh, Director Glasser mentioned, Taiwan is not Af Afghanistan, and also historically, both countries are totally different. And also, the commitment of U.S. to Taiwan is different to U.S. commitment to Afghanistan. And Taiwan is a very important uh, linkage in the Indo-Pacific architecture. I do think that as our democratic country work closely together, we can, you know, create new model of the regional collaboration between uh, U.S. and also its stakeholder in the Indo-Pacific. And one thing that I would like to share with you is during the past uh, years, as China become more assertive and more confident with the promotion of the Belt and Road Initiative, definitely they try to penetrate Taiwanese society by cultivating their uh, stakeholders and also their, their uh, supporters. And those supporters and also those stakeholders share the disinformation among our society and try to disturb uh, the mainstream uh, public opinions and the recent criticism and also the recent doubt uh, according to the case of with regard to the case of Afghanistan and uh, I think they have something related to the disinformation uh, war so I will stop here Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yang. Uh, let me now turn to Dr. Sana Hashmi. You know, Sana, I have one question from you. Uh, you know, you are based in Taiwan. Uh, what are the expectations in Taiwan from India? Uh, is there a feeling that India is far too cautious in its Taiwan policy, even post Kalban? I think during my uh, interaction with the uh, scholars and po uh, policy makers here, there's this one question that always pops up, why India is so cautious, as you have also asked in your question, and why India is not reciprocating. So with the starting of new Southbound policy, there have been several initiatives, uh, but we don't see that kind of government level enthusiasm from India's side. So of course, this is one of the concerns from Taiwan government and uh, of course, there are a lot of things, but this one question that always comes up that it's okay, there are people to people ties and there are a lot of other uh, areas of cooperation, but when is 
the level of interaction is reaching at the government level even if not at the leadership level but at least some kind of government level interaction should be there and i think this is why i strongly believe that uh, as previous speakers also talked about having dialogues in different areas of cooperation such as cyber infrastructure and i have been uh, talking about and i've been advocating for a policy planning dialogue so it should be at the level of joint secretary senior official level if india is not very comfortable and i understand because you know we have this boundary dispute with india and us is far away but china is just next door for india so india has to be a little cautious when it uh, think considers changing is taiwan policy or china policy but i think if uh, india considers initiating policy planning dialogue and policy planning is one of the most important and robust leverages that they are doing a lot of activities with like-minded countries in the Indo-Pacific. So I believe that maybe at mid-official level or maybe at deputy secretary level, a policy planning dialogue should be initiated. And I think it's totally achievable because when the representative offices were established, uh, the retired officials used to go and used to come and head uh, ITA. But now the policy has changed. Now we have uh, uh, serving officers as the head of ITA. So I think this is also achievable. India should consider uh, initiating policy planning dialogue. And it's very important to have information sharing mechanism. I, I don't think that actually is institutionalized. There is a lot of things that are happening which are away from the public domain. But I think we could totally start a dialogue with the policy planning uh, as the facilitator. Thank you. Uh, Sana, there's a question in the chat box also for you from uh, Manjushri Mishra. Uh, have you seen the question? I uh, saw the question. Yeah. Let, 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 me, let me just read it out uh, uh, to Ms. Hashmi. If you could elaborate more on what are the setbacks that India and Taiwan uh, suffer from by not maintaining official diplomatic relations? The bilateral relations between both nations are at an official level. Uh, I don't think that this is a policy goal of either India or Taiwan. What Taiwan wants right now is to expand its international space when China has been trying to poach its allies. And with the new southern policy, Taiwan is doing exactly the same. Uh, so I don't think we can actually talk about unachievable uh, outcome when we talk about elevating ties between India and Taiwan. So I think we should really say that what are the setbacks when we talk about elevating the uh, having official diplomatic ties with uh, India and Taiwan. But I would say that there's a lot of change in India's approach towards Taiwan since the 90s, 1990s. And in fact, uh, within the past three, four years, I see a lot of change that has happened uh, within the Indian uh, uh, IR, uh, within the Indian policy circle. I, I will give you an example, like for example, in uh, 2018, when the dollar Doklam standoff happened, the parliamentary committee on external affairs came up with this report and they suggested that uh, India should establish diplomatic ties with Taiwan. And at that point of time, then Foreign Secretary of India, Vijay Gokhale, actually said that this is not feasible in India. It has to one China policy and there's no way that this would be changed. And even when the Air India, they changed the name of Taiwan from Taiwan to Chinese Taipei, uh, EMEA actually came out in support of Air India. But I think there's a change now. If I may give you an example of what happened in 2020 in October, when the Chinese embassy in India issued a diktat asking a media to not refer to Taiwan as a country and while, while covering Taiwan National Day, uh, MEA issued a statement and said that it's a free country and we can't really stop media from doing what it wants to do. And even this year, what we have seen for the very first time, uh, MEA, the spokesperson of the MEA, he actually tweeted uh, when there was a crash, a plane crash in Taiwan. So that was the very first exchange of social media between India and Taiwan. So there's a change in policy, as I said, that it will be a little slow, but there are positive developments that have happened between India and Taiwan. And uh, I think it's just a matter of time when India is going to talk about Taiwan openly. Thank you. Uh Thank you, Sana. Uh, we have some questions um, from the YouTube channel where this event is being live streamed. I will uh, pick up one of the questions from Mr. Lido Lee and request uh, uh, Bonnie to respond. Uh, the question is it's 
somewhat along these lines. Uh, uh, just a second. In Taiwan, uh, one of the most controversial topics these days is the credibility of the American commitment to the allies. During the ABC interview, President Biden mentions commitment to Taiwan in the same breath as treaty allies. While a week ago, Mr. Sullivan reaffirmed the US, USA's uh, rock solid commitment to its allies in interview, uh, where he mentioned Taiwan along with Israel. Uh, so Bonnie would like to, to comment on this issue of US commitment to allies, including Taiwan. Yes, um, this was, I think, a confusing episode, not the first time uh, that a U.S. president has mischaracterized uh, U.S. policy. Um, and uh, although some people um, would like to believe that this was deliberate, I think if you if you look at the uh, uh, text or watch the interview, uh, the question uh, included Taiwan. So there was a reference to Taiwan in the question and then the president's answer, I believe, was essentially aimed at sending the message that the United States can is a reliable partner and ally, and it will uphold its commitments. Um, and he conflated um, our commitments to allies with our commitment uh, to Taiwan. Had Taiwan not been mentioned in the question, indeed, I think he would not have mentioned it in the answer, he probably would have just talked about allies, but he talked about Japan, South Korea, and then uh, Taiwan. So I think he was really conflating the two. Um, the uh, question in the chat box states that the United States uh, did not make further comments or retractions. That is not true. Uh, the uh, State Department spokesman uh, did make a statement that uh, U.S. policy toward Taiwan remains unchanged, um, and there were several senior officials who made similar statements on background that were quoted um, in articles, including um, a, a Reuters uh, article that uh, I was uh, quoted in as well. Um, of course, nobody is going to say the the, the president made a gaffe um, or uh, misspoke, uh, but uh, the, the point is that the US policy remains unchanged. Jake Sullivan did refer to Taiwan and Israel. These are two um, important partners of the United States that are also not, not treaty allies. And But why were these statements really, really made to begin with? This is because there is a, an ongoing discussion about um, essentially questioning US commitment and resolve in the aftermath of the withdrawal from Afghanistan. And President Biden's take on this is the United States has been in Afghanistan for 20 years. Uh, we've spent over a trillion dollars. We've lost over 2,000 lives. Um, nobody can say that we were not committed uh, to the country. Uh, but um, I believe from my own perspective, it is fair to uh, criticize the United States in terms of its execution, the way that this, this withdrawal was uh, conducted. So it's more a question to my mind of competence rather than um, uh, resolve. What uh, Sullivan and the president uh, were both trying to do was reassure um, US allies, partners, countries around the world, the United States is not withdrawing from the world. We are not going to be isolated um, or, or seek a policy of isolation because we are withdrawing from uh, Afghanistan. Indeed, I would argue that it is in part, not of course the main driver, but in part because of the US recognition of the challenges posed by China and the growing importance of the Indo-Pacific, that we've come to the conclusion that it is time to end the war in Afghanistan, which has been a drain on US resources, but even more importantly, US attention and focus as our entire defense enterprise has only very slowly been shifting from the counterterrorism mission toward dealing with a great power um, uh, peer competitor. Um, and, and so ending this war, I think many of us who work on the Indo-Pacific, many of the senior officials I know in the administration who are responsible for policy toward the Indo-Pacific, hope that the United States will be um, turning more attention uh, to, uh, to that region. And so this should not be seen as a, a questioning of, of US resolve to come to the 
uh, aid of its allies to uh, to um, implement its its obligations or um, to come uh, to Taiwan's defense if uh, if necessary. And so I think there 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 was a need and continues to be a need for the United States to provide reassurance. And I think that's ultimately what was behind both the statements by President Biden and our national security advisor, Jake Sullivan. Thank, thank you very much. No, we have uh, several other questions now in chat box, but we have run out of time. So I'll limit myself to two questions by, from uh, David Markey, one uh, addressed to Dr. Ellen Young and one to address to uh, Bonnie Glazer. Uh, can we start with uh, Dr. Young? Uh, the question uh, you might have read in the chat box uh, is uh, what could be practicable mechanisms for the European countries and India to increase the level of political exchanges with Taiwan? Would you recommend more countries to follow Lithuania? Dr. Young. And Bonnie, uh, there's a question for you yeah. also in the chat box from uh, Mr. Markey. Uh, thank you for the question of uh, David. Uh, I think uh, it is uh, uh, it is possible to connect the democracy across the European region together. So Taiwan recently work closely with uh, the Lithuania for the for the official tie and it is not only working with our European counterpart in terms of economic collaboration but also more uh, exchange among the peoples and during the past months when Taiwanese society encountered uh, the the local infective infection cases. We do thank our friend in Europe Europe to support us by sharing their vaccine with Taiwanese people, and I do think this is the presentation of the warm power by sharing the resources, experiences, and best practice. So apart from this recent diplomatic progress. I do think that we can extend the multifaceted engagement between Taiwan and European countries, especially the democracy. Democracy should work together, and especially in the post COVID-19 pandemic era, the restoration of the new normal and also the new economic and social order should be highlighted and Taiwan's case as a best practice in Indo-Pacific of the maintaining the social and economic resilience against the pandemic can be sharing with our, our European countries. So uh, as David mentioned, what could be pra pr practicable mechanism for European countries and India? I think it can we can work on the bilateral uh, approach first and then to expand that into a more multilateral or regional time and focus on the practical issues like the pandemic governance and also the resilience restoration issue how to maintain the social resilience among the civil society to fight against the pandemic the re rise of the pandemic in the future. I think that could be very uh, <clears throat> pra practicable and also will be non-sensitive issue to collaborate. And this is my uh, suggestion and my answer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, finally, you know, I will request uh, Bonnie to respond to a question from uh, Mr. David Markey. Uh, I'll relay the question in terms of conducting a more strategic approach towards China. Do you see the likelihood that G7 countries and Quad could adopt a deterrence strategy with clearly communicated consequences should China undertake military steps towards Taiwan? Uh, 
clearly the willingness of, uh, of countries uh, to take these kind of steps will vary. Um, uh, G7 uh, countries, uh, sorry, countries in Europe, I think, um, may be less willing, although I hope that that would change if the threats uh, to Taiwan's security were really quite clear and more imminent. So as the situation exists today, the willingness of, uh, of, of countries to impose costs on China or make clear what those costs would be, I think is, 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 is less likely. But if, they, if it appeared that uh, a military strike was more imminent or more likely, perhaps there would be a greater willingness. But then the question is willingness to do what? Um, uh, in the economic realm, uh, perhaps uh, a willingness to impose sanctions, but I'm sure we would all immediately think about the Tiananmen sanctions, um, and China was willing uh, to uh, take that risk of using force in Tiananmen Square for obvious reasons, uh, and uh, then uh, that response of the international community, um, the imposition of those sanctions, um, it really didn't last very long, and I think that China would calculate again that um, after a period of time, that uh, particularly now that so many countries have China as its number one trading partner um, and uh, see China as, as an important economic partner, perhaps fewer countries would even be willing to impose economic sanctions. So we'd have to think through what our levers are. What are and and then match that up with the willingness of different countries to take certain steps. Uh, but uh, uh, some countries again might be more willing to do things uh, than others. Um, I have advocated that the United States, for example, uh, be willing to make clear steps that it might take, um, even if China is using coercion against uh, Taiwan, not just uh, to deter use of military force. So, for example, uh, uh, if China were to uh, poach another diplomatic ally uh, uh, from Taiwan, uh, the United States could say in advance, if you do this, the United States is going to invite uh, Tsai Ing-wen not just to transit through the United States, but to make a visit. Uh, to the United States, which we have not seen since uh, Li Donghui uh, in 1995. Um, uh, and that would uh, signal support for, uh, for Taiwan. But the hope would be that it would deter uh, China from taking that action of stealing yet another partner uh, from, uh, from Taiwan. So that's an example of something that can be done to deter um, these uh, gr the gray zone coercion against Taiwan, which I think deserves more study and more attention. Um, not that I want to downplay the threat of uh, military force and the consequences. I think we should strengthen our deterrent strategy there as well. But we should not do so at the expense of responding to these gray zone threats, which I believe um, are growing. Um, and ultimately, China wants to really convince the people of Taiwan that um, they they have uh, the, the situation is hopeless, uh, that they should not have any confidence in their government or their institutions, and they should just give up and surrender and reunify uh, with the mainland. That is ultimately China's strategy is to win uh, without fighting, without bloodshed. And so we need to help um, give the people of Taiwan um, confidence in their government and create more space for them, um, strengthen their economy, their ensure economic prosperity, as well as their um, uh, security. And so there's many steps that India and like-minded countries can take to do that. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you, Bonnie. You know, we have much to discuss, but we have run out of time. In fact, we have exceeded the time that we allotted for this uh, for this conversation uh, so i will dispense with any any you know substantive uh, concluding remarks uh, it would suffice to say that uh, we had very rich discussion uh, beginning with uh, remarks uh, introductory remarks made by peter remele and uh, very perceptive comments by three speakers and then excellent uh, the dialogue we had after that uh, among us. So thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, this uh, panel discussion has helped us uh, acquire a more nuanced underst understanding of what's happening in cross-strait relations, uh, what's happening in terms of uh, responses of India, USA, and other like-minded countries uh,
to developments in uh, in uh, Taiwan China relations and most most particularly a number of concrete suggestions that have emerged during dialogue today on what can be done by India in its Taiwan policy. So thank you very much, uh, 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 our colleagues in CAS. Uh, thank you, Bonnie. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Sana, for joining us in this dialogue today. And we hope to continue this conversation. Thank you. So let me. Thank